Good morning, everyone. This is a reading from the Bhagavad Gita, um, and the title is Like Attracts Like. This passage is from the Bhagavad Gita, the third chapter, the 36th and 37th stanza. Arjuna said, Yet tell me, teacher, by what force doth man go to his ill unwilling, as if one pushed him into evil path? Krishna replied, Desire it is, passion it is, born of the darkness, which pushes pusheth him, mighty of appetite, sinful and strong as this, man's enemy. The Bhagavad Gita speaks here of the qualities of human nature, not only as particular to individuals, but also as universal to mankind. These qualities are not limited to mankind. They have existed from the beginning of creation. <clears throat> Elsewhere in the Gita, we read that the universe is formed of a mi mixture of three basic qualities, gunas, as they are called in Sanskrit, the clear and clarifying, called sattva guna, the active and activating, or rajaguna, and the dark and darkening, or tamaguna. Every human characteristic expresses one or more of these qualities. They pervade every aspect of nature. Matter, too, expresses them, for creation is but a manifestation of consciousness, a dream in the mind of the cosmic dreamer, locked in the heart of all things, as their most closely held secret lies in the germ of consciousness. Whenever we express kindness to others, we attune ourselves to the universal quality of kindness and are sustained and reinforced by it in return. Again, if we express cruelty, we attune ourselves to the universal quality of cruelty. That conscious aspect of nature strengthens our own cruelty in return and makes it the more difficult for us to escape evil's clutches should we desire at last to reform. These universal conscious qualities in nature also express themselves through the power of habit. Every action, if repeated often enough, becomes a habit. The more the conscious repetition, the more quickly the habit is formed. Habit stands in relation. Sorry. Um, habit stands in relation to the universal gunas, somewhat in the way a piece of blue colored glass stands in relation to the color blue. The glass is reinforced in its blueness when placed against a blue background. Like enhances like. Like, as is also well known, attracts like. Habits attract to themselves those gunas or qualities with which they are in sympathy. In turn, they become strengthened by them. These facts shed light on a fundamental spiritual principle, namely that good habits can be generated not only by personal effort, but also by prayer and inner communion, which unite us to the great power of God. A child of infinity, doubt not, O children of infinity, doubt not the divine goodness, for God's power is yours. If you would but draw on it, man is saved from delusion, not by self-effort alone, but even more so by divine grace. By right effort, we open the door to the inflow of grace. Right effort means to focus our minds in deep concentration on God, to offer him our unconditional devotion, to have complete faith in his con unconditional love for us. It means to open ourselves to him on every level of our being. Right effort, in other words, must not be confused with the ego-conditioned thought, the more I do, the more I'll accomplish. Rather, it might be summarized as relinquishing the thought of self as the creator and developing the awareness that the doer is God. The Lord's power alone can liberate us from human limitations. He alone can expand our infinitesimal consciousness into vast reaches of infinite bliss. Beginners on the spiritual path should strictly avoid any thought and action which might obstruct the development of good habits. Wholesome habits are the first and forever necessary step to ultimately ultimate freedom in infinity. Like attracts like. If we express evil, we cannot but take on the qualities of evil. evil. But if we express goodness, we take on the nature of the ultimate good. 
Thus, through the Bhagavad Gita, God has spoken to mankind. Om, Om, Om. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm trying to visualize your faces through this camera lens. I can see some of you, of course, on the TV, but it would look rather odd to the whole time be uh, treating you to the side of my face as I looked at the TV. This topic, like attracts like, is one of the fundamental teachings on the spiritual path, and it's so practical, and it's such a um, powerful and transforming truth in um, in a very expansive way, pardon me there, um, because the, the title of this reading in Rays of the One Light, the book we usually read from, is Does Satan Exist? And so uh, the, this is a whole topic of does Maya, this is essentially what Arjuna is asking, what force is it that drives one to act against his own in interests, to do wrong, to do what he knows to be wrong against his will? What force is it that there is a force? And that uh, then Krishna explains in this context, desire it is that, uh, and habit that drives us to do this. And Master explained, he said, I used to think that Satan or Maya was just a uh, mental concept created uh, by mankind. Uh, just a thought, just an idea. He said, but now I, I have, now that I've realized God, I add my testimony to others that this is a very real conscious force trying to drive us more into Maya. Now, uh, why should there be such a force at all? Well, uh, the uh, the story goes, uh, you've probably heard it many times before, but for the one or two who may not have heard it, that when God first created this whole universe and planet and everything, uh, he also created uh, people and uh, put them on the earth, and he made them all wise and all-knowing. And so they, being all wise and all knowing, looked around at this and said, well, it's all pretty, but it's nothing compared to the joy of being in God. And so they sat down and meditated and went into samadhi and merged back into him. And God sort of scratched his omnipresent beard and said, well, that didn't last very long. I'd like the show to be a little, have a little more to it. And so when he sent people down again, he also created maya, this delusion, this veil that separates uh, us from seeing clearly the truth, obscures the truth. And so people got distracted by things that you can sort of think of it as a bunch of commercials on the TV. Oh, what's this? Oh, what's that? And so they ran off in all different directions in pursuit of uh, uh, different entertainments and so on. So the, um, this is the, the force that keeps us bound, keeps us going in delusion, keeps us, uh, again, keeps God's creation going. And so it's necessary in a way, it's a polar opposite pull. It pulls us in this direction. And we have to understand that this force is not logical, it's not rational, meaning it's more powerful than logic, it's more powerful than reason. We can think that, no, no, I can do this and I can outdo that and I can think my way through, and we can't. It's, uh, in some ways, you could say it's the, the devil's greatest tool or Maya's greatest tool is working through our own logic, our own reasoning faculty, because so very subtly it will guide us wrong. How is, does that happen? Well, first of all, remember that reason, logic, always follows our feeling, our desire. It can be 
uh, a good desire or it can be an other kind of desire. And so if the heart wants a certain thing, the mind will slowly find a way to make that conclusion true. And so uh, Swamiji, for example, tells the story of when he was a young disciple and he had been missing Master. Master had been gone for uh, several weeks and finally when Master returned, Swamiji was eager to see him and so word came to Swamiji that uh, could he send someone of the monks to carry a big uh, jug of water up to Master's room to replace the one that was there uh, so Master could have a new supply of water. And so uh, Swamiji writes in the new path that he eagerly appropriated the task to himself and gave himself the duty and brought the heavy jug upstairs. And Master was in the other room of his apartment and Swamiji uh, made about as much noise as he could, he said decently, trying to attract Master's attention while Master was dictating a letter in the other room. And so Master took no notice of him. And so uh, Swamiji was hurt and went downstairs and, uh, and felt that disturbance in his heart. And so then he tried to... Um, uh, he was feeling upset about it and he tried to get out of this feeling and he uh, said, I tried to reason with myself uh, out of this mood that, well, after all, uh, he was busy uh, dictating a letter and he said immediately other thoughts came such that, oh, I bet he wasn't even dictating a letter until he heard that I was coming. And as soon as he heard I was coming, he said, look out, here comes the worthless disciple, Walter. Quickly, I'd better dictate a letter as a reason to not have to talk to him. And uh, Swamiji said he knew that these reasons were ridiculous, but still they kept coming. And he finally said to his mental citizens, do we like feeling this way? And he said, they all cried out, no. He said, well, almost all. There were one or two grumblers in the background. But he said, well, boys, what are we going to do about it? And he decided to try to raise his level of consciousness. And so rather than using any kind of thinking, he just sat down uh, and concentrated very hard here at the spiritual eye and just kept his mind there. He said five minutes was all it took and the mood lifted and he suddenly saw all the reasons why it was perfectly you know, uh, normal for Master to do that and he said if he gives all his time to each one of us where, what time will be left for anyone else? And so again with his feelings calmed he was better able to uh, you know, have his logic flow in the right way. So we have to understand that we can't think our way to it. Swamiji would often give this example, which is one that Master gave, um, illustrating this point about how uh, we can't think our way out of delusion, we can't think our way out of the ego, even. He said that, Master told the story that in a certain village, um, Three people had died. And no, this is the wrong story. Oh well, too bad, I've already started. So this is the, the wrong conclusion, but the, <laughs> but the story is coming. There's the, another story I'll tell after this one. So in a village, three people had died. And the people of the village went to the saint uh, who, was, who lived nearby and said, you've got to do something, people are dying here. And so the saint uh, said, I'll, I'll handle it. And then in his meditation, he saw that the, those deaths had been caused by a demon. And so he summoned the demon to uh, appear before him, and the demon came. And the saint said, this village is under my protection, and I order you to stop. And so I don't know what contracts saints and demons have, but anyway, the demon said, okay, fine, I'll cooperate. And then... After a week, a hundred people had died. And so the, the village 
villagers came back to the saint and said, you said you would protect us. And he said, you know, Orimsha. And so they went away and he called the demon and he said, listen, I warned you, I told you that, uh, that not to stop doing this. And the demon said, I wasn't doing anything. He said, it's true, I killed the first three, but the rest died from fear. And so you, that's a very interesting story with a deep conclusion that unfortunately doesn't really fit into my talk right now. So the other story <laughs> is that a man was trying to, uh, was being haunted by a demon and he read in the Vedas that there was a certain ritual that you could do to banish all demons from your mind. And so he, he the demon was sitting there and he took, the man took some powder, that prescribed powder from the Vedic ritual, and he said a mantra into the powder, and he threw it on the demon, and the demon just laughed at him. And the demon said, before you could even say your mantra, I myself got into the powder, so how could it affect me? And Master said, this illustrates how the mind is already affected or even infected with the very disease it's trying to cure, and so it cannot cure itself. To, to mix the metaphor, we cannot lift ourselves up by our own bootstraps to heaven. We have to find another way. Swamiji's story already illustrates uh, the way to do it when he put his mind here. And that was how he burned off this mood. Now, it's all very well and good to acknowledge that desire, old habits drive us to uh, do things that we don't want. Uh, to do or that we've decided not to do and there's a very important teaching in this as well because we when we come on the spiritual path we finally pick up life by the right string we learn the yamas in the niyamas maybe we heard them before but now we learn them in a way that we can perhaps relate to better or that really help us to feel uh, more expansive around that. We learn all kinds of proper attitudes and what we learn most of all is that by meditation, by doing these things, by living in the right way, we feel happier. And that's its own motivation, its own reward for uh, following the right laws of living. It's for our benefit, for our joy. It isn't for our misery that these are all the restrictions. All the things you want to do, those are bad. And so you can't do them. That's not the law. It's rather that things that we're attracted to still that are actually harmful for us, the masters come to teach us, it can be appealing, but it will end in disaster. As master said, temptation and evil is like poisoned honey. He said poisoned honey will taste good, but it will kill you. The honey part is the part to watch out for. Poisoned, um, you know, I don't know, poisoned pavakai, no one will want to eat anyway because it's pavakai. I happen to like pavakai, but most people don't. So the, there's, no, there's no harm, there's no danger there. So it's the poisoned mycer pock that gets us into trouble. So yeah, so uh, <laughs> Darmini is saying, what, you know, please don't send the pavakai in the Mysore Pak right now, because frankly, right now, we don't know if anything is poisoned, uh, unfortunately, in, this, in the circumstances we're living in. So the, um, the temptation then is attractive at first, and the teachings are warning us that for our own happiness, we should go in another way. But we have this desire, this thing that's impelling us, and we have to acknowledge that this is from the past. And I shouldn't feel that just because I know that this is not the right course, and I do it anyway, that I should feel guilty about it. You see, in other words, it can be, it's a common problem on the spiritual path in the beginning, in the middle, maybe even in the end, that just because we know we shouldn't do something, like for example, lash out in anger, and then we do it anyway, and then we feel, of course, badly that we behaved in that way, but we can add more uh, guilt onto that feeling, saying that, and I know that I shouldn't do it, and so therefore I was even worse or even more uh, incorrect because I knew I shouldn't do it, and I still did it. As if knowing 
that we should behave in a certain way is enough. And going against that was a conscious choice. You see, it's not a conscious choice most of the time. It is a desire, it is an urge, it is an impulse from the past. And so if Arjuna is asking Krishna, what is it that makes us do wrong against our will even? If Arjuna is puzzling over this, it tells us, shows us that we're in good company and that the, even a deep de devotee, in fact, Arjuna was self-realized, but still he was asking this question on behalf of all of us, but still it's a very real question. That, and the answer is compassionate. We, Krishna's answer is not condemning, condemning, desire it is, and so don't have desires. Okay, fine. Not a very useful teaching because we do have them. You see, so really the question is, what do we do about it? And that's how the, the teaching of Swamiji's um, commentary that Dharmini read, like attracts like. If you want to be good, Mix with good people. If you want to uh, behave in a peaceful way, do those things that make you peaceful. If you don't want to behave in a certain way, try to avoid those things that are of that uh, same vibration. In other words, uh, first of all, talking about the gunas, sattva guna, raja guna, and guna, and tamo guna, sometimes spiritual people, all they'll see is the ways in which they're tamasic or rajasic overlooking the fact that they are primarily sattvic people. To be on the spiritual path makes you sattvic. Even on the highest yuga on this planet, satya yuga, Swamiji said, really it just means that uh, everybody on the planet more or less is like us, like we are. On the spiritual path, consciously trying to find God, they have a certain advantage that they can pass easily to the astral world and come back again. But beyond that still, it's only the astral world. That's not God. There's more to it. And so we can feel that uh, we are sattvic people. It's true. I mean, as, as Krishna said, out of a thousand, one seeks me. And out of a thousand that seek me, one perhaps knows me, which can sound depressing at first. But Master said, our percentages are far greater. So don't think that just because you know better and you still acted wrongly, that you should feel badly or guilty about that. That is also maya. That's another mistake. And so don't worry about all of that. Just let your resolve to do better. As Sri Yukteswarji said, forget the past. The vanished lives of all men are dark with many shames. Human conduct is ever unreliable until anchored in the divine. Everything in future will improve if you are making a spiritual effort now. And so again, like attracts like. A similar teaching on the same subject that Swamiji gave is, as we think, so we become. And so as we direct our minds, that leads us to growth, that leads us to what we will become. Not what we do in this moment, what we think forever locks us here, but how we are oriented. What is our attitude? Is it up or down? And so it's uh, kind of funny because we were looking this up that attitude in a, uh, when speaking of airplanes, ref refers to uh, the direction of the nose of the plane. Is it pointed upward or downward? And so it's funny that even in that sense, at, that's a deep teaching on attitude. Which way is our nose pointed? Our spiritual nose, not our literal nose, because if you point your nose up, it tenses the ego, so that's no good. <laughs> but are we aimed up or aimed down? It doesn't talk about our altitude, <laughs> meaning how high above the ground are we? How close to heaven are we? The altitude is determined by the attitude. If we're aimed up, we will go up. And if we're aimed down, we'll go down and then up. Because just pull your nose up. It's like that song of uh, Swamiji's uh, Come Gather Round. And he says, lift up your head, greet the rising sun. And so whenever we're in sorrow, whenever we're feeling uh, badly about ourselves, and just remember his words, lift up your head. That's all that's needed. And greet the rising sun. 
And so remember also then the Swamiji's other words <laughs> around guilt. He said, if there is one word I would like to eliminate from our vocabulary, it is guilt. There's just no reason to feel guilty. On one level, guilt just uh, makes us feel that, well, I should be better than I am. And instead of changing it from, let's change it from should to want to. I want to be better than I am. I want to grow. I want even better than that. I want to be with God. I want to be with Master. And that will automatically make us better. You see, by keeping the divine company, or as Sri Yukteswar said, by keeping the company of divine personages. It's just so wonderful the way he puts things. So, Remember this then, that if we're struggling with darkness, if we're struggling with maya in ourselves, I'm speaking now, of course, to devotees. There's no point in uh, saying you should come to the spiritual path. You, are, you have come to the spiritual path. You're on the spiritual path. And so remember then that uh, as the song that we listened to earlier says, if we want to see the sunrise, let us turn and face the dawn. It's such a beautiful teaching of Swamiji's that if, we, if our back is to the sunrise, if we're focusing on the darkness, what are we going to see? And so he says, let us turn and face the dawn, aim in the right direction. We already are doing that, but the point is it's a choice to do every day, a choice to make constantly, not to rate ourselves on 100% accuracy, on a, a, every time we do it, but to increase the percentage of times that in the middle of some difficulty we <sighs> turn and face the dawn, whether we put on a music, a song of Swamiji's, a video of Swamiji's, whether we sit and meditate, where we, whether we do super conscious living exercises, something to shift the energy is what is needed. And so the, the other line in this song, the, which is the chorus, which is repeated, is something Master said all the time. You can't drive out the darkness with a stick. He said, you can't get rid of darkness by beating at it with a stick. We can't get rid of the darkness in others by beating at it with a stick. We can't get rid of the darkness in ourselves by beating ourselves with a stick. Master said, a room can be in darkness for a hundred years and all you do is turn on the light and the, the darkness will vanish as though it had never been. So how do we turn on that light? Well, of course, as it said in the reading, we can meditate, chant, all the things we do on the spiritual path. But the point is to do these not just as a habit or as at our scheduled sadhana times, but also to do them as an emergency measure. I'm feeling very upset about something, I'm feeling very frustrated and I can't put my mind in a positive way because it keeps going in the other direction. So let me just chant, let me just, as I said, reach for help and then see if that can shift my attitude, shift my mood, shift my consciousness. Also though, as Swamiji said, to develop good habits it helps simply to put our mind on God because that aligns us with goodness, that magnetizes us, that fills us with goodness, and we automatically then want to behave in a better way. For example, we can work very hard on acting more calm, but if we meditate, we become calm, and then our heart is more relaxed, it has more um, patience, automatically because of its state of rest, its state of peace. You see, not through any mental effort or deliberate choice that I will be more calm, we are calm. And so it doesn't take any effort to maintain that calmness. Uh, it takes effort or to develop that calmness. It gets tested, of course, uh, maybe right after the meditation, the moment after, but still. We, we can align ourselves with the divine and then we will automatically develop in these qualities. Like attracts like. And so let us remember then 
that really what saves us, what, what purifies us, what frees us ultimately is not our self-effort alone on this level, but really our self-effort to open ourselves to Divine Mother's love. The illustration that Swamiji often gave was how uh, the sunlight shines on the side of a building on even a window, but if the curtains of the window are closed, the sunlight can't enter the room. It isn't the sunlight that's holding back, it's rather if we open the curtains, which is to say to open the curtains of our mind, to open the curtains of our heart, the sunlight floods in. It's important to remember that the sunlight shines on all windows. It isn't that God's grace favors some people over others, that some devotees are more blessed or more uh, loved by God. All are loved equally, but not all are loving God equally. Master said this to Rajarshi, his most advanced disciple, because he had a very close relationship with him. He was very uh, gentle, very... Um, caring, very, uh, very loving in his speech and his letters and so on. And with other disciples, Master could be quite strong, quite stern in his speech. And, uh, and it was hard to take. And Master uh, said to Rajashi, the relationship I have with you, I would like to have with everyone, but not everyone would be able to take it in the right way, in the right spirit. And so Master, in giving sternness to someone else, was not showing disfavor. Rather, he was showing uh, just as much care because he was giving them what they needed to become free. It wouldn't do them any good to just indulge them in their weakness and their illness and so on. But it wasn't coming from our emotional reaction. Master never uh, reacted that way. Whereas when we feel criticized by others, we can feel even perhaps their actual judgment of us. When somebody is harsh or negative towards us, we may feel that they really are feeling that way. But if Master spoke harshly or strongly, he wasn't feeling that way. But we may, you may not have been able to tell the difference. We can also see it now that Master is challenging us through the life circumstances, even through the people around us, by saying, what will you be able to take? Not in a sense of endurance, but in a sense of calmness, a sense of going with the flow, of recognizing that this is God's show, and he's taking care of us. I am reminded of a story once when Master was scolding a nun. She was in her room. He opened the door. I mean, he was standing in the doorway, and he was correcting her strongly about something she was not doing. And then he turned and closed the door and left. And she started praying to Babaji. And then Master opened the door and came in again and said, No fair going over my head. So let us remember that we just need to open ourselves to God's grace and the sunlight of God's grace will warm us, will purify us. It's that really that heals us and we don't have to do all the work ourselves. Master said 25% of the spiritual path is our own effort, 25% is the Guru's effort on our behalf, and 50% is the grace of God. Let's make sure we're uh, getting our full 50% worth of help from God by just keeping God with us, doing all the things to align ourselves with God. As I was saying, it isn't just the habit of meditation but and all these good things, but also to reach for them in a time of need. Swamiji said, after all these years of meditating, I don't see how people live without meditation. And he said, I find meditation so beneficial, not the cumulative effects of meditating only, but each day's meditation. The solutions I get to problems, the insight I get into a particular philosophical point, the joy that I feel washing over me, again, each day. And so remember that, that in this moment we can take a, take a, a, a break and meditate and feel that help pouring into us. We just need to turn and face the dawn. So God bless you.